sixth lecture and our topic would be second order circuits for which we had started last time, we will complete it this time, a discussion on second order circuits and we will also talk about magnetically coupled circuits. It is 102 now. As you recall, our second order circuit that we had started discussing consisted of a battery of voltage V, a switch which is switched on at T equal to 0, a resistance R, an inductance L and a capacitance C. And we had our aim was to calculate the current I of T in this circuit, we had taken I L of 0 minus equal to 0 and V sub C of 0 minus equal to 0. That is the circuit is initially relaxed. And by taking Laplace transform, we had arrived at the solution I of S equal to V by L divided by S minus P 1 times S minus P 2 where P1 and P2 are the poles of the circuit and are given by P12 is equal to minus R by 2L plus minus square root of R squared by 4L squared minus 1 over LC and we have decided to call this as minus alpha plus minus beta. And then we are good that three cases may arise, one is that beta is real beta is real that is R squared by 4 L squared is greater than 1 by L C and the second case that we had considered was when beta is equal to 0 that is R squared by 4 L squared is equal to 1 by L C. In the first case, in the first case, case 1 when R squared was greater than 4 L by C our solution, our solution was I of T is equal to V by 2 beta L, 2 beta L e to the minus alpha T times, well I could call this as, cancel this 2 then this is sin hyperbolic beta T. Is that correct? Does it check with what you had obtained earlier? This 2 factor I am taking into account and I am writing it in this form. And as I said, <coughs> this represents a current which rises, which rises like this has a maximum and then falls to 0 at infinity. This is the case R squared greater than 4 L by C. On the other hand, in case 2 we had considered R squared is equal to 4 L by C and under that condition we had shown that the current is given by I of T equal to V by L T e to the minus alpha T because under this condition beta equals to 0 and therefore we have two repeated roots and that is why this product by T comes in and for this, for this case the plot would be something like this. Yes, of course, we must multiply by u of t, both the solutions, that is correct. And this case is for r squared equal to 4 L by C and we said that this case r squared that is case 2 corresponds to what is known as critical damping, critical damping and the case corresponding to red line here is to be called the over damped case. These two cases we considered in details last time. It remains to consider case 3 when R squared becomes less than 4 L by C that is the resistance decreases, resistance decreases and as, a, as I had commented last time if the resistance is such that R squared is less than 4 L by C, then the circuit breaks into oscillations and energy keeps on, keeps on exchanging between the inductor and the capacitor that is the elect electrostatic form to electrodynamic form 
or electrical energy to magnetic energy and this keeps on oscillating till the presence of the resistance after all the resistance is a dissipating factor and that accounts for gradual damping gradual decay of the oscillations. Well to, to treat this case mathematically let us look at our solution that is I of I am sorry capital I of S is equal to V by L 1 by S minus P 1 S minus P 2 and our P 1 2 I am considering case 3 P 1 2 is minus R by 2 L plus minus square root of R squared by 4 L squared minus 1 over L C <coughs> and our case is that R squared is less than 4 L by C and therefore this is also equal to minus alpha plus minus beta therefore beta is purely imaginary therefore we put beta equal to let us say j omega 0 then my poles are minus alpha plus minus j omega 0 and it is very easy to show by writing i of t as some constant k 1 e to the p 1 t plus another constant k 2 e to the p 2 t and by combining the complex the imaginary terms it is very easy to show that this can be written in the form k e to the minus alpha t e to the minus alpha t comes from e to the p 1 t and e to the p 2 t both have minus alpha as a common factor and therefore e to the minus alpha t the damping factor goes out and then you have sine of <coughs> omega 0 t plus some constant theta. <coughs> and we are now required we are now required to find out k and theta the two constants. <coughs> To find theta first i of t equal to k e to the minus alpha t sin of omega 0 t plus theta. To find theta you notice that i of 0 minus was equal to 0 and since the current in the inductor has to be continuous this is also equal to i of 0 plus and therefore the if I put this value here I get theta equal to pardon me how much would be theta it would be 0 t equal to 0 so sin theta sin theta is 0 and therefore theta is 0 all right therefore my equation becomes i of t equal to k e to the minus alpha t sin of omega 0 t then how do I find out k obviously I require an i prime d d t and I have already shown that irrespective of the case that is considered it is simply equal to plus v by l not minus it is equal to plus v by l alright the current increases from 0 and therefore the slope is positive. If you substitute this and find out k then the ultimate solution I can write as v by l omega 0 e to the minus alpha t sin of omega 0 t this is my total solution and you <coughs> and you indeed see that this is an oscillation sin omega 0 t the current starts from 0 that is why theta is 0 ok the current starts from 0 value yes i dash 0 plus yes ok all right i dash 0 plus equal to v by l and of course there shall be the ever present u of t here and you indeed see that if e to the minus alpha t was not there then it is a pure sinusoidal oscillation sine oscillation because of the factor e to the minus alpha t the amplitude gradually decays that is our solution our solution shall look like this. it will gradually decay and this envelope goes according to e to the minus alpha t all right this envelope is e to the minus alpha t it is a <coughs> and this is called 
अंडर डैम्प्ड केस and after we have identified under damp the meaning of the word critical damping becomes more clear critical damping is the border line between oscillations and no oscillations if the damping is slightly less than critical damping there will be oscillations if the damping is slightly more than critical damping there would be no oscillations and that's why critical damping is called critical damping okay yes frequency well the expression is i of t equal to v by l omega 0 e to the minus alpha t sin of omega 0 t so the frequency is omega 0 so, but it neither we, decreases nor increases the way we have drawn it the frequency is no uh, forgive my <laughs> bad drawing <laughs> the period is the same okay I have always been poor at drawing, so you have to take this as sine of omega 0 t. Okay? The frequency in a linear system, linear system can neither decrease nor increase, frequency has to remain the same. It is only in the case of a nonlinear system that frequency can change. It also shows that if alpha was equal to 0, now alpha by definition is r by 2 l, if alpha is equal to 0, then there is no damping damping is 0 and <coughs> the oscillation would have continued ad infinitum without any reduction in the amplitude and this case we have already treated one special case we have already treated a pure inductor and a pure capacitor connected in, in series or in parallel in a loop. Okay. Two elements in, the, in series or in, in parallel means the same thing. Okay connected in parallel and they create sustained sinusoidal oscillations. This cannot be achieved in practice because of the inherent losses in the inductor and capacitor. Okay? And that is where we require an active device. To make an oscillator, we require an active device which shall supply the energy necessary to counter the dissipation in the inevitable resistance and induct resistance and in the inductance and capacitance that is this decay factor in order to counter this we require an active device like a transistor or an op amp now we consider a very interesting and important class of circuits known as magnetically coupled circuits faraday's laws of induction states that if you have two coils <coughs> near each other and if in both of the coils current flows let us say I2 and I1 <coughs> the voltages are V1 and V2 then the two coils affect each other. In other words the current in coil number 1 which conventionally is called the primary, the, the coil to the left is called the primary coil, the coil to the right is called the secondary coil, but there is no uh, sacred rule regarding this, a convention. Whichever coil is excited is known as primary. Now, if both the coils are excited, then obviously there is no distinction between primary and secondary, but nevertheless the terms are often used. Faraday's laws of induction says that whenever there is a coil or a closed loop in a magnetic field and the magnetic field is varying then a voltage would be induced in the coil. Now naturally when two coils are brought, brought close to each other if current flows in both then the flux of one coil links with the flux of the other coil. The flux of one coil links with another and this is mutual that is they share the magnetic flux and if in addition the flux is changing with time then there are induced voltages in both and to describe this phenomenon the corresponding element corresponding circuit element is a transformer known by various other names coupled coils or magnetically coupled circuit all kinds of names but basically it is a transformer. The name arises because it can transform one voltage into another 
it can transform one current into another higher or lower it can also transform a given impedance to some other impedance and that is why the, the word transform is there this is a physical transformer it is not a magnetic it is not a mathematical transformation like Laplace or Fourier right? this is a physical transformation changes one level of voltage to another either higher or lower similarly one level of current to another either higher or lower or a level of impedance you can get a higher impedance or a lower impedance depending on the design of the transformer but basically what is happening is that if the current if there are currents in both and these currents are changing then they induce a voltage in each other and this phenomenon is is described by means of a parameter known as mutual inductance m between two coils the mutual inductance m is related to the self inductances of the two coils l1 and l2 by the relationship m equal to k square root of l1 l2 where k is called the coefficient of coupling and has the highest value highest possible value is 1 k must be must lie between 0 and 1 it can be less than equal to less than equal to 1 ok and <coughs> k equal to 0 indicates that the coils are not coupled at all that is flux in one does not affect the other if one of the coils is here and the other coil is in the biochemical engineering block in all probability the magnetic field produced here would be so weak that it not it would not affect the other and therefore they are decoupled on the other hand k equal to once means there is perfect coupling that is what whatever flux is produced in the coil l1 couples with l2 also in practice this never happens because some flux always leaks out to nearby magnetic substances all right some flux always leaks out and therefore small k usually is less than 1 k small k equal to 1 is a very ideal situation and such a, a transformer in which k equal to 1 goes by the name of perfect transformer perfect the adjective perfect is used to denote the case in which the flux linkage is perfect that means there is no leakage flux no flux can leak out all flux generated by L1 also links with L2 all right however as far as induced voltage is concerned there will be no induced voltage if the flux is steady in other words if this if there is a direct steady current then direct steady current flowing in L1 and nothing flows in L2 the induced voltage would be equal to 0 because L D I D T there the current must be changing with time in order to induce a voltage. So, a transformer does not work at D C a transformer does not work at D C it cannot produce a voltage in the secondary if the primary current is not fluctuating fluctuation is an essential condition for a transformer to work transformer works on A C or any other varying current but it does not work on DC this is one of the most fundamental things that you should remember. <coughs> While we are discussing about there are several things which we, which we must clarify at this point uh, uh, while we are discussing about perfect transformer let me also in include let me also explain the term ideal transformer perfect and ideal and not the same thing ok one can be a perfect crook obviously is not an ideal human being an ideal human being has other characteristics associated one can be perfectly saintly but even then he may not be ideal there is difference between perfect and ideal in the case of a transformer all that is needed for perfect transformer is k equal to 1 that is coefficient of coupling is 1 flux generated in one coil always links with the other in the ideal case in addition to k equal to 1 in addition to k equal to 1 there are two other conditions 
attached that is the primary inductance tends to infinity, the secondary inductance tends to infinity that is very large inductances. What does this mean? That means a very negligible amount of current is required to create a flux. All right. After all the flux in a coil phi is the product of inductance and the current carried. So, if inductance tends to infinity zero current should be sufficient to produce a finite flux, finite non-zero flux. In practice capital L <coughs> uh, well in practice we cannot have an ideal, there is no ideal transformer. Ideal transformer is a concept which is very useful in circuit theory. Sir, sir, <coughs> An ideal transformer is perfect, but all perfect transformers are not ideal. ideal okay? An ideal transformer must be perfect because k equal to 1 is an essential condition. This is the essential condition. The second condition is that both L1 and L2, both of these inductances are very large. So that the magnetizing current required, that is the current required to produce a flux is negligibly small or infinitesimally small. But both the inductances go to infinity, but their ratio is finite. The ratio cannot be infinity, the ratio is finite. For example, 10,000 may be infinity to you, 9,900 9, may also be infinity, the ratio is finite. Okay? So, this is the condition of ideal transformer. An ideal transformer is a perfect transformer plus requiring no magnetizing current either in the primary or in the secondary the ratio of the two inductances however is finite this is the condition for an ideal transformer and we shall have we shall have occasions to refer to an ideal transformer very often it is a very useful concept cannot be realized in the laboratory no even a perfect transformer cannot be realized coefficient of coupling like 0.98 is very difficult to realize. Nevertheless, it can be realized with lot of shielding and all that. But a per ideal transformer cannot be realized. Yeah, sir. <coughs> sir, shouldn't there be a kind of compromise? Because if you have a very small current exciting, then you have also uh, then the inductance you're taking is very large. Mm. Then the voltage is also be very large. If you assume that it's something like a sinusoidal where dy by dt is not much, which means that if there is any small resistance, the current would be again very large. Oh, ideal transformer <coughs> current would be very large yes ideal transformer in theory can supply infinite amount of energy that is why it is ideal it does not exist and idea in both perfect and ideal transformers one of the conditions it is not essential but one of the conditions is that they are lossless that means there is no resistance there is no dissipative element okay as as you will see these are not practical elements, we cannot make them in the laboratory, we cannot use them as circuit elements. However, there are many non-ideal elements which can be represented in terms of an ideal transformer plus, plus lumped elements which account for non-ideal. This is where the use of ideal transformer comes. Okay. Now, in uh, the case of, a, of an induced voltage, there is a question of polarity. As you know, you can wind a coil clockwise or anti-clockwise. If the current flows clockwise, there is a certain direction of flux. If the current flows anti-clockwise, these are the right hand or left hand? Right hand, right hand rule. Okay. We do not have to go into the uh, controversy regarding right hand rule, which finger to point and which is the direction and so on. But we must be careful about, about the the polarity of the mutual inductance. I am showing a core, it is not necessary. Okay, there are L1 and L2 and as you will see, there are dots marked on a transformer, okay, dots and these dots have the following interpretation. Once and for all, you should learn it and you should never make a mistake in future. Let me explain to you the meaning of a dot 
uh, by taking a very simple example. Suppose, suppose you take a battery V and a switch. Okay. Now, if you put the switch on, the current naturally will pass like this. Correct? This is the battery. The current will pass like this. So, this terminal would be positive with respect to the lower terminal. Now, what you do is you include a, a voltmeter here in the secondary with this polarity. Okay, voltmeter is to be uh, <coughs> current flows like this. That is, this is positive and this is negative. All right. Now, as soon as you put this switch on, the voltmeter will give a deflection. As soon as you put this switch on, you are you are creating a current from zero current, and therefore there is a change. And this change will reflect in an induced voltage here. If the voltmeter reads correctly, if the voltmeter deflection is in the correct direction, this means that this point is also positive with respect to the lower point, all right, and that is the meaning of dot. If there are dots here and here, it means that the potentials of these two points fall or rise together. Is that clear? And under this condition, the mutual inductance M is considered to be positive. On the other hand, if the dots are one is here and one is here, then the mutual inductance is considered to be negative. So, capital M can be positive or negative. If both on the lower side then? If both are on the lower side, capital M is positive. Okay? And you should be able to do that. Our convention would be the following. Convention would be the following. If I have a transformer like this, L2, L1, and the dots are like this, M is this, and <coughs> let us say V1 is the voltage here, V2 is the voltage here. The currents, if the dots are like this, currents should both be going in. Because if this polarity is positive, that means current will go like this. Okay, I one and I two. Then the equations, the differential equations are that V one T is equal to L one D I one D T plus M D I two D T. This is the coupling term. This is the term that couples the second coil to the first. That is the voltage of the first coil is not determined by its own current only but the other current also has an effect. Similarly, V 2 T is equal to M D I 1 D T both are positive plus L 2 D I 2 D T. This is the convention with reference to this figure this is the convention capital M is considered positive. On the other hand if the dot is changed let us say from here to here everything else remains the same then this should come with a negative sign and this should come with a negative sign. In other words, we consider capital M to be <coughs> negative under that condition. Is the point clear? Yes? So, the voltage is the direction and the… Which voltage? <laughs> you see, if I change… Now, let me show it in a color. If I change the dots to this, nothing else changes. Nothing else changes. Voltage current conventions remain the same. Okay. Then we will write this with a negative sign and this will be negative. Me, so, when we write a minus sign we consider m is positive. When we add a minus sign no. When this is positive we consider m is positive. So, when we write a minus sign. When you get a minus sign m is negative. No. Okay. <laughs> m is negative means that the mutual inductance is minus m. The absolute value, the absolute value here, if you take the sign, if you take account of the sign, of course, it is absolute. positive, absolute value. Okay. It is like borrowing and uh, depositing. Okay. When you are borrowing, the amount is not negative. Amount is 5 rupees, 10 rupees, whatever it is, you put a minus sign there. That is what we are doing. Okay. So, this is the convention. Now, <coughs> if the mutual inductance is positive, then the total flux in the circuit, 
total flux in the circuit would be L 1 I 1. Now, let us put it this way. Suppose the number of turns in, in L 1 is N 1 and the flux per unit turn is phi 1. Let the number of turns in the second coil be N 2 and the flux per unit turn be phi 2. Then when M is positive the total flux will be the sum of the two. When M is negative which means that the directions of winding are different or the directions of current are different either of the two. Then the total flux will be the difference between the two N 1 phi 1 minus N 2 phi 2. And in a transformer the principle of continuity of flux shall be valid. That is flux can neither be created nor destroyed. If currents I 1 and I 2 change the flux cannot change instantaneously. That is the total flux shall remain the same and therefore, exactly like a capacitor in a capacitor there is continuity of charge here there shall be continuity of flux this shall be valid. So, does that imply that the total flux associated with L1 will be N1 phi 1 plus N2 phi 2? N1 phi 1 plus N2 phi 2, yes. And vice versa with L2 also the That is correct. The total flux in the system shall be N1 phi 1 if the two coils are coupled, not otherwise. Yeah. Okay, if they are coupled. Excuse me. Yes. So, you said that uh, M can be negative if the current is opposite or the turns are opposite. Okay, let me take an example. I know what is what is bothering you. Suppose my dots are like this and the currents are like this I 1 and I 2. Suppose it is so. Capital M the value of mutual inductance is the absolute value given. What would be your equations? V 1 equal to L 1 d I 1 d T. Now, I know this the, the value would be m d i 2 t t, but shall we take a plus sign or minus sign? Plus, plus because there are 2 minuses i 2 is in the negative direction and the dot is in the other direction therefore, it would be plus. Is that clear? This is the convention. This is because of the convention. All right. Let us go back to our original transformer and do a number of interesting things. We have v 1 I 1 this is the convention we always write it like this and we consider dots like this V 2 this. Whenever the dots are different or the current directions are different or voltage is polarity is different you can take care of it. But this is what you must remember under this condition V 1 equal to in addition let us say the resistances of the two coils these are also taken into account let us say we lump them into two resistances. R 2 and R 1. Okay. Let us consider that the coils are not perfect. We are taking count of the of the resistances. Resistance actually is distributed throughout the coil, but we are drawing the equivalent circuit. We are drawing the magnetically coupled part here and the dissipated part separately. Then my equation shall be V 1 equal to L 1 I 1 prime D D T I put as prime plus R 1 I 1 plus M I 2 prime all right. I do not want to write D D T again and again and the other equation is that V 2 is equal to M I 1 prime plus R 2 I 2 plus L 2 I 2 prime. Okay this will be my equations. Now, let us take a special case. Let us consider, let us consider V 2 as a short circuit. Take a special case. Let us consider this as a short circuit. So, that a current I 2 flows like this. Then obviously, V 2 shall be equal to 0. And let us say that V 1 arises because of a switch and a battery which is switched at t equal to 0. Then V 1 would be equal to V u t 
Agree? So V V is across the terminals of the uh, coil or across the individual? No, now V one is here. Yes, now V one is here because I have taken R one I one also into account. All right? It is this drop plus this voltage, and that voltage contains L one I one prime and M I two prime. All right? Agree? Now what I do is I integrate both of these equations. Now you must be with me. You have not done this earlier and you must follow carefully. I am working in the time domain. What I do is I integrate, I have taken a specific example. So the switch is closed at time t is equal to 0. That is right. So oh, I am sorry. I beg your pardon. It closes at t equal to 0. With initial conditions, okay, let us let us do that also. I 1 0 minus equal to I 2 0 minus equal to 0. The initial condition initially the circuit is completely relaxed, nothing to look into the past, okay. It has no history of any current and uh, the battery is closed, all right. Now, what I do is I am interested in finding I 1 0 plus and I 2 0 plus. All right. I want to find out the initial conditions of the circuit. It is given that before the switch is closed, the coils are absolutely relaxed. They have no flux, no energy. Okay. So, what I do is I integrate this equation, integrate this equation from 0 minus to 0 plus. If I integrate the left hand side as unit step function from 0 minus to 0 plus, what is the integral? 0. zero. zero. Differential coefficient is delta, not integral. Okay. So, what I get is 0 equal to the first equation. All right, let me write this again V u t equal to L 1 I 1 prime plus R 1 I 1 plus M I 2 prime and 0 equal to M I 1 prime plus R 2 I 2 plus L 2 I 2 prime. Okay. I am integrating from 0 minus to 0 plus. So, the first equation gets 0 equal to L 1 I get I 1 of 0 plus minus I 1 of 0 minus, okay? the first term. Second term I 1 of integrated between 0 minus and 0 plus is 0. Third term is M I 2 prime, so I 2 0 plus minus I 2 0 minus. In a similar manner, the second equation shall give me m times this plus l times l 2 times this okay the second equation now if you have if you have an equation set like this l 1 m m l 2 then you have i 1 0 plus minus i 1 0 minus I 2 0 plus minus I 2 0 minus this is equal to 0. It means well if I expand this I will get the same equation, but that is not what I want to do. What I want to do is the following suppose I have please try to understand this suppose I have two equations like this a 1 x plus b 1 y equal to 0 a 2 x plus b 2 y equal to 0. Suppose I have a set of equations like this, then it is very easy to show that the determinant of the coefficients which is a 1 b 2 minus a 2 b 1 multiplied by x or y both shall be equal to 0. Is that clear? Okay, this can be very easily shown. So, in my case L 1 L 2 minus m square if I multiply by I 1 0 plus minus I 1 0 minus this shall be equal to 0. If I multiply instead by I 2 0 plus minus I 2 0 minus this shall also be equal to 0. You understand the meaning of this equation? That is this multiplies either this or that in both cases it will be equal to 0. Okay? 
Now that is very interesting. How can this be 0? What are the conditions? Suppose I have a non perfect transformer that is L1 L2 is greater than m squared. Non perfect means the coefficient of coupling is less than unity. Okay. If this is so then this quantity is positive is greater than 0 which means that if the product of this and this has to be 0 then this must be 0 by a similar argument this must also be 0. In other words what I get is that in a non perfect transformer I 1 0 plus would be equal to I 1 0 minus and I 2 0 plus would be equal to I 2 0 minus. That is the currents shall be continuous not only the flux is continuous the currents are continuous. Okay. Is that okay? In sharp contrast will be the case when the transformer is ideal. That is if L1, L2 we shall show this but before that we will take an example. We shall show that if L1, L2 is equal to m squared then these do not have to be 0 because there is a 0 already here if L1, L2 is equal to m squared we shall indeed show that not only they need not be 0 they cannot be 0. That is we will show that in an ideal transformer the currents of necessity have to be discontinuous. We will show this, but before showing this let us let us take an example. Otherwise the current cannot flow. Just a second. Let us go back here. If this is not short circuited, the current I2 cannot flow and there would be a V2. I would not have been able to put this equal to 0. Okay? That was the need. All right. Let us consider an example. We consider an example in which the switch let me see I must be careful about closing and opening this closes at t equal to 0 and the voltage is let us say 6 volt the primary resistance is 3 and the inductance is 1 Henry with this dot the inductance is 2 Henry with, with the upper terminal dotted then there is a resistance of 8 ohms and the whole thing is short circuited. This current is I1 and this current is I2. The mutual inductance is it positive or negative? Positive. positive. It is 1 Henry. Obviously, m squared, yes. Sir, in case when the mutual difference for L1 and for L2 are different, that means for L1 it is. They cannot be different. No. The, for L1 it is M1, M1, M1 2 that is the mutual difference for which respect to L1. You must have learnt in your uh, high school that M12 is equal to M21. It, it is always true. So if the direction of current are reversed then we do not say that M is negative, you say that M is positive. You say, you say whatever you like, you write the equations correctly. <laughs> okay. okay. But M is uh, positive because the coupling is constant. If you take the sign correctly, I am willing to allow you any language that you use. <laughs> the differential equation must be written correctly. Okay? All right. My uh, definition was that if the currents are like this and the dots are in opposite direction, then we say M is negative. That means in the equation M d i d t terms will come with a negative sign. All right. That is what I meant. Anyway, now this is my. Uh, my circuit and you see the equations I can write down the equations by inspection 6 U T shall be equal to L1 I1 prime L1 is 1 Henry so I1 prime plus 3 I1 plus M is 1 Henry so I2 prime agree and the other equation would be 0 equal to equal to I1 prime 1 Henry I 1 prime plus 8 I 2 plus 2 I 2 prime. Okay? This is the equation. 
if I take the Laplace transform let us say if I take the if I want to solve it solve for I 1 and I 2 oh it is given that I 1 0 minus equal to I 2 0 minus pardon me. That is that will be true if k is equal to 1, m is given so k is less than 1 ok, m squared is less than L1 L2 therefore the coefficient of coupling must be less than 1 ok, alright. If I want to solve now it is given the initial the conditions before this switch was put on was that both the currents were equal to 0, if this is given and I am to solve the equation then if I follow Laplace transform method I do not have to bother about what is I 1 0 plus and what is I 2 0 plus I do not have to bother about this and very simple thing would be just take Laplace transforms you get uh, <coughs> S plus 3 S plus 3 then S S 2 S plus 8 okay multiplied by I 1 I 2 would be equal to 6 by S and 0 all right the characteristic equation or the poles can be found out from the determinant from the determinant of the left hand side the coefficient matrix and obviously the determinant is s plus 3 multiplied by 2 s plus 8 minus s squared do you know this characteristic equation okay this is equal to 0 this is the characteristic equation is taking Laplace transform we have taken that i 0 plus i 1 0 plus and i 2 0 plus is 0 mm. that is correct we have implied this so there is a catch in the whole thing is the point clear <coughs> this equation cause problem in that equation because l 1 l 2 is not equal to m square and here L1 L2 is greater than M squared and therefore there <coughs> shall be continuity of current and therefore what I wrote is correct here in this particular case not in all cases. Is this point clear? I have already shown that if the coefficient of coupling is less than unity then the currents in the primary and secondary both the coils have to be continuous at t equal to 0 that is 0 minus would be equal to 0 plus. So, when I take the Laplace of I 1 prime I simply write small s multiplied by capital I 1 I do not have to take care of I 1 0 plus because that is identically equal to 0 ok. So, the characteristic equation of the system becomes this and you can see that this is s squared plus 6 plus 8 14s plus 24 equal to 0 which means that s plus 2 times s plus 12 would be equal to 0. So, the natural frequencies of the system or the poles of the system would be at <laughs> minus 2 and minus 12 all right. Now, what I can do now once I have identified this I can write the two currents as some k 1 e to the minus 2 t plus k 2 e to the minus 12 t ok and I 2 t is equal to k 3 e to the minus 2 t plus k 4 e to the minus 12 t. The roots of the system that is the natural frequencies are real and negative and therefore I can write in terms of exponentials. However, however there is one mistake namely that in I 1 of t I 1 of t at t equal to infinity at t equal to infinity what is the current in this it will be simply 6 by 3 2 amperes it is not 0 and therefore I must add a term of 2 amperes here which signifies the particular solution or the particular integral and this is the solution to the homogeneous equation that is this is the complementary function ok. Now, in I 2 of t at t equal to infinity obviously this current shall be 0 
when fluxes have stabilized there is no induced voltage and therefore I do not need to add a constant here ok. So, these are the two <coughs> equations. Now, I can find out now k 1, k 2, k 3, k 4 from the initial conditions. Now, as I said if I had taken the Laplace transform if I had taken this and simply found out capital I 1, capital I 2 took the Laplace inverse the solution comes out very easily. But suppose I do not want to work in the frequency domain, I want to work in the time domain only. Then how do I evaluate? You understand my proposition? You can work in the frequency domain from this you can find out capital I 1, capital I 2, take the Laplace inverse and be done with it. But suppose I do not want to do that. I want to solve it completely in the time domain that is I want to find out k 1, k 2, k 3, k 4. Then one of the conditions, two conditions are that I 1 0 minus equal to 0 therefore I 1 0 plus is equal also equal to 0 which means that k 1 plus k 2 plus 2 would be equal to 0 the one equation. The other is I 2 0 plus equal to 0 which means that k 3 plus k 4 would be equal to 0. Now, I I have four constants to determine, I have two equations. So, I require two more equations. Now, how do I get those equations? I go back to the original, that is right. I go back to the original, I put t equal to 0 plus, then the left hand side would be 6 would be equal to I 1 prime 0 plus plus 0 because I 1 is 0 and I 2 prime 0 plus and then 0 equal to I 1 prime 0 plus plus 2 I 2 prime 0 plus from which by solving these two simultaneous equations I can find out I 1 prime 0 plus I 2 prime 0 plus and then going back to the original equation that is in terms of k 1 and k 2 I can solve for k 1 and k 2. What I will do is I will simply give you the final solution if you can verify this final solution is is the procedure clear to all of you yes, sir. ok. Therefore, I 1 is 2 minus 6 by 5 e to the minus 2 t minus 4 by 5 e to the minus 12 t this whole thing multiplied by u of t and I 2 t is minus 3 fifth e to the minus 2 t plus 3 fifth e to the minus 12 t times u t. Does this surprise you that these two coefficients are equal and opposite? No, because I 2 0 is equal to 0 and therefore these two. Also it should not surprise you that the sum of these two coefficients is equal to 2. It has to be because I, I 1 0 is also equal to 0. These are the various checks in the system and in circuit theory if you cannot check your results against common sense you must have made a mistake all right. As I said we did not have to go through the time domain complication we could have we could have used uh, Laplace transform domain only, but this is very instructive it is very instructive to do it. On the other hand when you go to the case of an case of a perfect transformer that is L 1 L 2 is equal to m squared that is the coefficient of coupling equal to 1 things will become a little more complicated and if we go to the time domain if you go to the time domain there is more illumination there is more light there is more knowledge more interpretation and more sources of joy as you shall see in a few moments. I have a few moments to spare. Now, if I take <coughs> suppose this is the condition suppose L 1 L 2 equal to m squared then as you see I 1 of 0 plus is not necessarily equal to I 1 of 0 minus and I 2 0 plus is not necessarily <coughs> equal to I 2 0 minus I must say necessarily.
No, I think I put two negatives, isn't it? Okay, okay. No, let me put it this way. Uh, my language has become slightly complicated. I1 of 0 plus is not equal to I1 of 0 minus. It may also be equal to start with. No, we will show that they have to be different. Okay, so I will cut necessarily. We will show that they have to be different. This is what we are going to show. The first thing we do is we write the equation to the secondary that is 0 as if you recall, recall <coughs> is equal to R2 I2 plus L2 I2 prime plus M I1 prime, right? This is the secondary equation. Suppose I put here uh, 0 t equal to 0 plus. I put here t equal to 0 plus. Then I get 0 equal to R2 I2 0 plus plus L2 I2 prime 0 plus plus m i1 prime 0 plus. Is that okay? I have simply put t equal to 0 plus, nothing else. <coughs> and in this equation, <coughs> I can simplify this to r2 i2 0 plus <coughs> is equal to minus l2 i2 prime 0 plus minus m I1 prime 0 plus. Okay. This is trivial manipulation. But because m squared <coughs> is equal to L1 L2, I get L2 equals to <coughs> excuse me m squared by L1, all right. Okay, the fun starts here. Therefore, I can write R2 I2 0 plus equal to I substitute for L2 and take minus M by L1 common. All right. Then what do I get? You see here I had minus M I1 prime 0 plus. And therefore, if I take m by L1 common, I shall get L1 I1 prime 0 plus. <coughs> and the second one, what do I get? Plus m I2 prime 0 plus. This equation will prove to be the most interesting equation that we have derived in this sixth lecture, as we shall show in the seventh lecture. We will continue this discussion. This is correct. I certify that this is correct. Okay, then we shall go back to this. This is the this is the term that occurs in the first equation, and that's where fun starts. We'll show. We'll continue this discussion next time.